What's going on? What you see is me taking out $25,000 out of the bank. The story was, I wanted to write a check for 100K. And the teller started laughing. She started laughing. She said, the most we can give you is $25,000. So I wrote a check for $25,000. And she gave me 10,000 in tens, 5,000 in fifties, and the rest in twenties. So all these folks you see online who are flexing all this cash, they've had it for a moment because you just can't go to the bank and withdraw 100K. Well, not, you know, I think it depends on where you are. I think if you were in Vegas, you could probably do that. But, and then there's another with me where I pulled out 10K and another frame where I pulled out 10K. Am I doing this to flex? Absolutely not. I'm doing this to illustrate what the average person cannot do. The average person would feel rich if they had $25,000 in the bank that they can go pull out. And there was money still in there. So in this video, I wanna talk about lessons learned from the poor. Because one of the things that I consistently see is, and this is the biggest lesson that I've learned from the poor. Poor people have turned getting money quickly into a religion. It is not a tactic, it is a religion. Anything that you like, there's this girl on YouTube and Instagram, Ellie Talks Money, how she took $1,200 uh, stimulus check and became a millionaire in a year. Um, Kelly OG, how she was a broke college student and she became a millionaire in a year. What, what you're seeing, now, once again, this is a fascination. This is a religion with poor people and it comes from the environments. Uh, you, you're consistently seeing that people who are poor are looking for, not even fast, lightning quick ways to get a lot of money with minimum effort. That's the religion. I've seen comments on this channel, like why work a job, you know? I don't work a job and I get money. This mentality that inhabits the poor is deeply corrosive, counterproductive, and it is a device that people who understand the pathology of the poor that they use to get money out of these poor people. Because I want you to put this in the comments. Name one person online that you've bought their lightning fast money tactics and you came up with 20, 30, 40, 50 grand in 30 days from scratch. Please name that person. Because what I see, and this is a big lesson that I see from the poor people all of the time, I'm about to give you a counter argument, and this is based on the environment. Once again, I'm 55 years of age, so I grew up when America was different. America was very, very different when I was growing up. And you were taught, indoctrinated, to get a job and to work hard. And this is what most Americans did in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, and to some degree, even in the 2000s. But once we got past 2012, things changed. So I grew up in an environment where hard work was rewarded. I grew up, once again, let's talk about the environment. The environment is everything. The environment is everything. And many poor people are in what I call resource deficient environments versus a resource rich environment. Give you a point. Jay Morrison, 
the Tulsa Fund. He raised $13 million, okay? There's a kid, a 20-year-old kid, who raised $25 million to buy Bed Bath & Beyond stock, and he made $110 million. You know what impresses me most about that story? Not the fact that he made $110 million off that play. Mm -mm. The most impressive thing to me was that he was able to go to friends and family and raise $25 million. That this kid grew up in a resource rich in environment. I guarantee you that more people know who Jay Morrison is and I will even go ahead and say this, more poor people know who Jay Morrison is. This kid literally probably talked to maybe 10, 15 people, and these 10, 15 people gave him $25 million to invest in the stock market. That's a resource rich environment. And when you operate in a resource rich environment, you understand that hard work, application, due diligence will pay off in the future, in the future. Now I have some assumptions here because I did not grow up in the hood. I did not grow up in the ghetto. I grew up in the suburbs, almost what was called back in the day, rural route rural route and I feel that for the people who grew up in the cities and the people who grew up in the ghetto and the people who had um, extreme crime and poverty in their neighborhoods they feel that they're not going to live long enough to work hard over a long period of time and they're gonna be able to benefit from that. So I feel that their whole modus operandi is to get as money as quick as possible and enjoy life as fast as possible because they're not gonna be around that long. That's just an assumption that I have. But I grew up in an environment where consistently I was able to work hard. Let's say the year was 2010 was able to work hard in 2010 and 2012, 24 months later, it paid off. And I feel that many poor people are not in that environment. They're in an environment where they can work extremely hard, i.e. a job, and regardless of how hard they work or how hard they don't work, or if they do something that's called quiet quitting, they're gonna get the same money. So what I, one lesson I've learned is many poor people do not understand how to position themselves in a resource rich environment because let me put this in, I'm gonna put this in the comments. How many of you actually personally I'm not saying know of, because I know of Jay-Z, but I personally don't know Jay-Z. But how many of you actually know, and I'm gonna define know, a person who is a bona fide millionaire that you can call up with and say, let's go to lunch, let's hang out. This is one of your boys or your girls. How many of you actually know millionaires? actually know on a personal level not i know this dude over here he got a big house i'm not talking about that i'm talking about you intimately know this rich person they've you've actually had conversations about money and you have a pretty good read on what this person's net worth is i actually i would have to say I know about 25 people like that, that actually know me, that we've actually met, we've actually had lunch or dinner, I've gone to their house, they've come to my house. I would say I know about 25 people that I know for a fact are bona fide millionaires. 
that I know on an intimate, personal level that I know a lot about these people. How many of you actually know someone like that intimately? They're, they're your friend, they're your boy, they're your girl. And there's, there's a reason I say this, because this is another lesson that I learned from poor people. Poor people are extremely confident in their assumptions. I literally get it in the comment sections every day of this, because once again, I, I'm a nerd. I do criminal profile, I do criminal minds profiling based upon the language that you use in the comment section, the kind of verbiage you use or lack of certain verbiage. I can tell your educational level. I can pretty much nail down your income level. And most of the assumptions or outrageous comments come from poor people. Give you a point, case in point. This happened. Someone left a comment. Yeah, you got your course on discount on, on a promo code now, and it's going to be on sale in October. Now, for those of you who've known me, who've been around here, how many times after I completed the course have I put it on sale? Put that in the comments. How many times have I completed the course and put it on sale? How many times have I fire sale the course, lowered the price, and sold it? How many times have I done that? Please put that in the comments. And one of the things is that poor people are overconfident in their ability to size up a situation. I will give you an example. A YouTube creator who was talking about just run ads. Now, um, running ads, like here's the thing. If you don't know what you're doing, running ads, and I'm gonna give you the play-by-play -play on how to run ads, and why one of the reasons that I typically don't run ads. Number one, you've got to have what's called a testing budget, because you're gonna have some ideals, some assumptions that you feel are valid, but until you actually run the ad with that assumption in it, you're not gonna know. And you're really gonna start off kinda of small. So you need to test and you need to have three to five um, creatives. Your creative is your ad. And you need to run your ads and you need to see which one converts better. This is gonna take you two to three months, just testing, seeing what works, what doesn't work. Because if, let's say you had $100,000, right? And then you started just buying ads with no testing, with no protocols, with no framework, you're gonna pretty much not get a return on your spend. And this is why when the YouTube creator talk about just run ads without the backstory of the things that you need to do, like I know Travis Chambers, you can Google Travis Chambers. He has a YouTube channel. A YouTube channel. I know Travis Chambers does about 10 million a year. I've actually met Travis, had dinner with Travis. Travis is a bona fide media buyer. He spends millions per year for his clients. And I look at the things that they do in their business and they would never ever just make a commercial and start running ads. They would never do that. You wanna know why they won't do that? Cause they know it won't work. It will not work. You just cannot. Create a commercial, you've got to get data, details, insights about your target, and once again, your target audience. If you run ads and have no clue to who your target audience is, you're gonna lose money. Case in point, uh, there's a guy here on YouTube that's called uh, Clients on Demand, and I, uh, their course is pretty pricey. It's like nine, ten thousand $10,000. And I had someone who bought that course and they came to me and they bought my course. And they said, your course was way more helpful than this course because the client on demand thing, here's the thing. And I'm not gonna slam clients on demand because if you are like, if I actually was to buy a client on demand, I would probably do okay. 
Why? Because I'm selling my products without doing ads. So that means I kind of have an ideal who my client is. I, can, I, I have a lot of stuff where I can actually go ahead and buy that course and it will be successful for me because I'm already successful. It will just make me more successful, right? Whereas if you are a raw rookie with no audience, no email list, you just wasted $10,000 buying that course. You just wasted $10,000. See, um, one of the things that poor people, and this is, this is a common trope on YouTube. There's a guy named Jesse Eagles. There's a guy named Corey Mission Side Hustle. And Jesse is on a goal to, his goal was a zero to a million dollars and he, he, he's operating in the crypto space. And this is what's funny about Jesse. Jesse made 1.5 million, but he couldn't get his crypto out. He couldn't liquidate. And I, I've kind of noticed that happen to a lot of people who make, who on paper, like got a million dollars, but they can't access it. That's really, really strange because that's like having a million dollars in the suitcase at the bottom of the sea that you can't reach. You just can't reach it. And Corey, I feel that Corey's path is more realistic because Corey is actually learning stuff. He's learning stuff. Corey is actually selling stuff, meeting, he's, he's doing the hard things. Whereas Jesse's thing is to do it from the comfort of his own home. And Jesse's new goal is zero to a hundred million. So that's going to be interesting, but you consistently see poor people without any delay, any delay gratification. That that's, that's, that they ain't a thing in the poor community. Um, right now I have a friend, his son is graduating from Georgia tech next year. He's going to roll into a hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollar a year job right out of college because he's taking computer science and his emphasis is on cybersecurity. That's a hot, hot feel right now. But, you know, once again, this young man grew up in a resource rich environment. His dad's a millionaire. He has an Audi, you know, whenever he, he like this, this is what his dad told me he did. He gave him four credit cards. He made an authorized user on four of his credit cards and gave him guidelines. It's like, use this one if you need money, use this one, use this one. This is the card that you can spend up to $2,000 a month. And this young man, to his credit, followed his father's guidelines. How many of you, if when you were in college, would have appreciated having a father that can not only pay for your college, the kid actually got a full ride, but there are other expenses that his dad handles. Um, and to give you four credit cards, give you, give you four credit cards, right? That's three. Give you four credit cards, right? And pretty much a generous budget and you're driving a car that dad bought you for, you don't have a car payment. You don't have credit card bills. You don't have, you're not gonna have student loan debt when you graduate school. Cause this young man is grew up in a seriously resource rich environment and he worked really, really hard. And his hard work is gonna pay off cause he's operating in a resource rich environment. But if you are a poor person operating in a resource deficient environment, you can literally work your ass off and still be poor. And this is the common thing that I see with poor people that there's no realization that you're working in a resource deficient environment. You know that you don't have enough money. You know that, you know that, but you haven't quite figured out that you need to move from this resource deficient environment to a resource rich environment. When I was in that boarding house and I was, 
struggling. When I entered my scheme incorporated job and got that job at Rent-A-Crate, I entered into a resource rich environment in a network. Do you understand that the job that I got after Rental Crate, I met because I had got in that network? And the job after that, I got same network. So I, I made, I jumped from Rental Crate to panel systems to business environments because I had entered into a resource rich environment. People that I used to network with drove Mercedes, Audi. Um, there was one guy who was a commercial real estate broker who lived literally around the corner and we would meet in their conference room to have, a, have our networking meeting. And he lived literally around the corner where I live now. He may still be there as far as I know, I don't know. And one of the things that poor people don't understand and I have to really, really, really think about this. When your mama didn't know better, when your granddaddy didn't know better, and your great granddaddy didn't know better, I think that this creates a cycle of mediocrity. And let me explain what I mean by that. I remember years and years ago, my, <coughs> my aunt Inez, they were the Cosby people in the family. Um, my uncle Jimmy married my aunt Inez and they had three children. And my uncle Jimmy was a commercial real estate. Well, he was a, he was a real estate broker. He wasn't a real estate agent. He was a broker. He had agents working for him. This was a black man. So my aunt Inez was about five, five, maybe 125 pounds after having three children. And she was very particular. And one day she came down to visit and my neighbors were just wallowing, literally wallowing in the mud, wallowing in the mud. And she looked at them with such disgust and she said, they ain't never had shit in life. And more than likely they will not have shit in life. And my aunt Inez made this prediction 40 something years ago. And she was 100% correct. So once you're in this resource deficient environment, and there's no one to help you, to break you out, to expose you. Take Melanie Hopston. She's uh, one of the chair people. She's married to George Lucas. Melanie Hopston grew up in a resource deficient environment and she got plucked out of that environment and she got put into a resource rich environment and she ended up marrying a billionaire so i don't you know because ariel she used to be on the news she used to she used to be on tv she used to be talking she became like a spokesperson for ariel investments and here was a girl who grew up poor who made that transition because you see see this this is the thing you cannot stay in that environment and this is one of the reasons that i see rappers rappers will go ahead and make a lot of money rapping but they will stay in the hood and what will happen is they will get robbed or they will get abused or they will get talked about or they will get harmed because they refuse to change environments if you look at ice cube dr dre they left those hood environments and went to resource rich environments. And both of them became very financially prosperous. So, and also the read on them is they were both middle class as children to begin with. And then they hooked up with Easy e who was an authentic hood dude. And that's one of the things, but I see this lesson all of the time. 
And like, one of the things that I consistently see with poor people, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be straight up and this is gonna be bougie as hell. I purposely do not answer the door when my DoorDash people show up. I let them leave it at the door, even though I'm right here, I'm sitting right here waiting on it. I let them leave it at the door because I have seen that the majority, like this happened the other day. The majority of DoorDash drivers are low edge, low, ink, low, 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 they're not very well educated. And many of them are unaware. You know what I mean by that? I saw a DoorDash driver who was a dude who had like this red fro, unkempt. He had on this tie-dye shirt that was probably two sizes too small. He had on these shorts that was probably three sizes too small. He was extremely fat. He had on some um, Crocs. He looked like a hot mess. And I've noticed this, that you've got some door dress drivers who actually get up, put on color coordinated clothing and comb their hair and look presentable. But you have no clue to like the Instacart people, they typically dress better. Once again, this is gig economy analysis. And I, I've noticed this because I use DoorDash, I use Instacart, and typically the Instacart people are better. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why. But typically, and like I said, this is bougie. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. So I'll let them leave it at the door and then retrieve it after they're gone because I have no clue who the hell I'm going to be meeting at the door. And I like Domino's Pizza because Domino's Pizza, they wear uniforms. Once again, this is 100% bougie. But I have noticed that poor people don't have any sense of priority or, you know, of awareness, how to dress, how to speak, how to act. And that's not a sin. That's not a sin. The sin is not wanting to improve or to elevate. That's the sin. That's the, the problem. That's the debt, like, like I said, and I'm, I'm just gonna be, a, I'm, just, I'm gonna be 100% clear. Like my aunt, aunt Inez, I looked at, you know, I looked at her cause these were my neighbors, they were my friends. And I didn't, at the time I was very young and I didn't understand why she had that level of contempt and disgust. I understand exactly because I'm that way today. I'm bougie. I like, I am bougie. I am bougie. It's like, if you don't know how to conduct yourself or speak or dress a certain way, I don't want to be around you because that is simple stuff. That's simple. Another lesson I've learned from poor people. And this is what's funny. Many of the girls who will enter the sugar baby world will charge an older, fat, rich dude money to have sex with him, right? But she will give that same box to Lolo, Too Cool, Tori. And it's, it's very funny because I, I know a girl, her name is Kimberly. And Kimberly decided I think she was 32. She says, I'm going to be celibate until I get married. And she wasn't giving nobody the box. Nobody. And two and a half years later, guess what? She was married. She was married. Still is married. And what I see with poor women, especially today, which for me is very unappealing, is a ton of tattoos. And I'm like, the tattoos don't make no damn sense. Like there'll be a starfish over here. It would be Tweety Bird over here. It, it's just, I got drunk 
I got high, and I went out and got a tattoo. That's pretty much how that happened. Or like, with a, like, or with a, I met, I saw this girl, I didn't meet her. She had a neck tattoo. When you get a neck tattoo, you're pretty much saying, I am not gonna be a member of conventional society, ever. And I see this stuff, these neck tattoos, these thigh murals, these bag murals, and I've dated a few girls with some well thought out tattoos where it looked like artwork. But when you get to the poor people, you will see tattoos that make no sense. Because here's another reason. Why would you go out and get something that's gonna be on your body for literally forever without deeply thinking about it? This is, uh, poor people have really low impulse control. Really low impulse control. This is why somebody can get killed over some cold fries. So you, you see that. And what I see in the age of social media, I remember growing up and being poor, but wearing clean clothes, dressing, you know, appropriately cutting the grass. We were poor, but we had pride in appearance, in the house, cleaning the house, cutting the yard. That's out the window right now. And this is why I don't want to live around. I'll give you an example. I had some friends who bought a house in Latonia. And they spent, this was years and years and years ago. They spent like, probably 200,000, that'd probably be $800,000 house today. And they moved in and they noticed that their neighbors had sheets on the windows. Not just plain white sheets, that would have been cool. They had cartoon characters on the sheets because they used the sheets from the children's bedroom. And she was hot. She's like, we ain't spend this kind of money to be living around these people. And it got worse and worse and worse. And these people's house got foreclosed on. They were foreclosed on. So what you're seeing is, and once again, I'll speak about my bougie self, is a separation between people who have money and people who don't. Because one of the things is, it's a comfort level. Like the 25 people I know, when I got my Porsche, I was like sending texts, screenshots, and all those pictures and all this other stuff. Because I could flex, I could share with them. My, the people I went to high school with, uh, unless they watch the YouTube channel, they don't know I have a Porsche. I never even brought it up. Because I can't with those people. I can't be myself with those people because me being myself would come off as flexing, bragging, because they don't have shit. Most of the people that I went to high school with who are my age, most of them don't have shit. I mean, there's some that did well, but most of them don't have shit. And I'm aware of that because I haven't logged into that Facebook page and I don't know when. Because I have two Facebook pages. Well, I had three. I had my original Facebook page with my high school friends on it. Because I realized early on that when I was posting stuff on my original Facebook page, I started to get some comments from my high school friends who did not understand the transformation that I was undergoing. So I created another Facebook page and this is where I made all my new internet friends and all this other stuff. And I was able to talk that talk. But yeah, man, the, the lessons learned from poor people, I consistently see it. And like I said, with social media, it's getting worse. <laughs> it's not getting better. It's getting worse. Like take all of these people who are going to jail now for all this PPP loan fraud. What did these people do? They went out and bought houses, cars, 
jewelry, had cosmetic surgery. Not one of them threw the money in the stock market. Now, maybe, you know, maybe the ones that they haven't caught yet bought, you know, because there will be some people who will literally get away with this. They're not going to catch everybody. Maybe there's some people who bought some real estate, made some investments. But every time JT Pocket Watch, when they put up there, it's always foolishness. It's never, they're never buying assets. This is the mindset of the poor person. They're never buying assets. They're never buying anything. I mean, some of these folks got millions, millions, but because they have the poor person mentality, my old video, hookers and blow, as soon as they come into some money, we're gonna take some trips. We're gonna go to some fancy restaurants. We're gonna buy a nice car. We're gonna get a nice house. We're not gonna we ain't get no investments. No, 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 no. We ain't doing that. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. That's the pathology of the poor people. And if you do not change your ways, you were born poor, you're gonna die poor. The, the stats are really clear. The social economic class that you're born into is usually the one that you will die in. This is, this is, this is so clear. It is so, I mean, I see it over and over and over again because like, once again, the way I was selling the intellectual property school, I've been talking about this for years. You're looking at a three year journey. I'm not selling this as you're gonna be able to do this really quickly. You're gonna be able to um, make a lot of money really quick. I'm not selling it like that because it ain't like that. My first, like the reason that I made so much money on YouTube so quickly was because I had business experience. Literally August, September, October, I came out with my first digital product. And from October 2009, October 10, I made $62,000 selling my digital product on YouTube. And at the time my YouTube channel wasn't monetized. And then October 2011 to October 2012, I made nine, 2000. Channel still wasn't monetized. And then 2012 to 2013, that's why I made that 1.5 million. So even with business experience, knowing what to do, it still took me three years to come up. Three years. And the lack of delayed gratification, once again, fast money to poor people is a religion. And once again, I, I gave I gave you some uh, assumptions that maybe these people don't feel they're gonna live that long and that's why they gotta make it fast and enjoy life as quick as possible. I don't know. I don't know. But once again, understand that you should look at poor people, you should watch what poor people do, and to have different outcomes, you should do the complete opposite. Kimberly, Kimberly was, Kimberly was sexy. She did not have any children until after she got married. Could be reason she's still married. Um, once again, that's another big, big issue. I did not have any kids until after I was married. Did not stay married, that was bad. But at least I tried to do it the right way. And once again, you know, the lessons for poor people are around us, low impulse control. And um, as I predicted, we had our first female, well, probably one of many female shooters here in Georgia. The lessons of poor people. They keep, we keep learning and learning and learning. It's interesting, man. It's very, very interesting. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank <laughs> you.